delighted to be able to say that, that in this audience, we not only have students and faculty and staff, but alumni and trustees and community members. And this is exactly uh, what Southwestern should be all about, uh, sharing uh, original ideas and creativity all together and joining in the conversation. So welcome, and I will turn it over to the students. Thank you, everybody. Hello, uh, my name is Jeanette Brown, and I'm from Laurel, Maryland. I'm a senior, and I'm going to be graduating this upcoming May with a Bachelor of Science in Animal Behavior. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Dr. Faye Garachi. Dr. Garachi graduated from McGill University in 1994 with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. From there, she moved on to the University of Vermont, where she earned her PhD, after which she spent three years doing postdoctoral research at Dartmouth College. At first, her research focused on the neurocircuitry of fear and aversive stimuli, but she eventually changed course to follow the famous lifestyle of sex, drugs, and rock and roller derby. <laughs> She's made a couple of adjustments. Um, her areas of expertise now include drugs of abuse, sexual motivation, and fertility. Her research has been published in journals such as Physiology and Behavior and Pharmacology, Biochemistry, and Behavior. This is her 12th year at Southwestern University, and during her time here, she's earned several awards and honors, including receiving the Southwestern Teaching Award in 2007 and being a Brown Junior Fellow from 2006 to 2007. I met Dr. Garachi two years ago when I took her research methods class. At the time, I was kind of struggling uh, with the decision to change my major from psychology to animal behavior. I didn't really know what that change would entail, how it would change the course of my life, and I was kind of nervous and scared about it. But um, learning about Dr. Garachi's research and being able to experience what she does firsthand and do some of it myself really helped make that decision easier, and I'm so happy I made it. I have learned a lot from Dr. Garachi, both from the classes I've taken with her and from the time I've spent working with her as her teaching assistant this past semester. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Garachi as she presents her lecture, Breaking Bad or Breaking Good, Drugs of Abuse and Motivation. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. I hope this is interesting for you as it is for me. A lot of you are familiar with the show Breaking Bad. Any fans? Okay. So the focus of Breaking Bad is on how a guy named Walter becomes consumed with the power and uh, spirals out of control. And the means for that power and the money and where he ends up is crystal meth. It is a drug that's on the rise in the US and is very lucrative if you start selling it. The interesting thing about the show, the ups and downs of the characters, and about crystal meth is that some aspects of crystal meth taking methamphetamine, are enhancing. They enhance parts of your life, like your sex life. Whereas other aspects of crystal meth destroy your life and ruin lots of different parts of you. I have been studying over the years how drugs of abuse, like crack, like crystal meth, can interact with things that we find naturally rewarding, like sex. And as a result, we've learned a lot about how the brain works, how the brain gets hijacked by drugs of abuse, and why drugs of abuse are so powerful and hard to quit. So part of my research has focused on female sexual motivation. There are not many people who study it for various reasons, but from years of doing this research here at Southwestern and where I started at Dartmouth, I feel like we've been able to advance our understanding of the neurobiology, the brain circuits that are critical for motivation in general. In addition, by developing some great animal models, and I'm gonna talk about three of them today, we've been able to advance our understanding of drugs of abuse, so when, when motivation goes awry, as well as our normal, natural motivations that we come prepared. And ideally, I hope someday that some of this research can be expanded into understanding and developing treatments for sexual dysfunction for women, which is a growing problem that not much has been done to alleviate. So to study sexual motivation, I realized that initially what had been done is they looked at animals in a small chamber like you see here, and there's a male and there's a female. And the people that were studying it looked at the behavior and they said, oh, the female arches her back when she's approached by the male. It's kind of easy to see. The male is the big one, the female is the small one. And if you look, what I see with this is I see a male chasing a female and her responding pretty passively to his 
his advances. Occasionally, she'll give him a good kick in the face. And um, I was really surprised when people were like, OK, this is what happens. Um, they saw this and thought that was enough. But at some point in the 80s, someone said, well, maybe we should think more about what's going on here. Are females that passive? Do they play no role in an encounter like this? And as a consequence, Somebody said, let's think about how these animals interact in the wild, considering the natural habitat. If we're going to use animals as a model, it's important to think about that. So in the wild, if you didn't know, um, there are lots of rats around here, so <laughs> you might have been familiar with some of them. They live underground in a burrow. And the way they live is all the females live together. They hang out together with their offspring and juveniles. The males live alone. Uh, sometimes they live in small little groups, but they don't live with the females. They only come together to mate. And what ends up happening is when the females go into heat, so they're able to reproduce, they'll emerge from the burrow, and lo and behold, there'll be a bunch of male rats hanging out by their burrow. And so they'll engage in some mating behavior. But what was interesting, what somebody noticed is, they don't just stay there, the females. They quickly retreat into the burrow in the middle of things, right? They're in the middle of having sex, and then the females run away. But they're not done. They come back out. They reemerge from the burrow and engage in mating behavior um, and continue on. And so what someone, Martha McClintock, in the late 70s, early 80s realized, well, that's a really interesting part of our sexual motivation, that we some kind of approach behavior and some kind of little break. And she noted that that's kind of what people do, right? They flirt, they play hard to get, and then they run away, and then they pursue. And so she thought, this is a great model that's not so different than us. So how do we study this type of motivation, these behaviors, in the laboratory? Um, so initially, the first studies continued to look at lordosis, that arching of the back. It's a reflex controlled by hormones in different circuits of the brain. That's great. That's important. But by adding this active component to the motivation, where females need to approach, they found that females flirt. They didn't think rats flirted, but they flirt. They engage in these behaviors. I'm not going to demonstrate them. If you're in my class, you'll see me demonstrate them occasionally. Um, all of my students have probably seen me. Um, they hop around in these cute little behaviors. They wiggle their ears, which is really their head vibrating at a really high rate, but their little floppy ears uh, wiggle. And they present themselves to the males. But the interesting part is that that burrow escape behavior that you saw, like I told you about in the burrow system, they will do that by running away and then coming back. And we've developed a number, and I'm gonna talk about three paradigms that we can study this approach and withdrawal behavior that's stereotypical of this motivation. So to do this in the lab, we've, at, we've designed the apparatus in a way that um, modifies what you saw in that first video. Instead of having them confined to a small chamber, we allow the female to have access to the male when she wants to, but the male can't leave. He's confined over here. There's small holes that you can't see, and he's too fat to fit through them. So he stays on his side, but the female can go back and forth. I'm going to show you in this video. So the female's in the middle. She's going to interact with the male on the right, and she's going to go through the holes, visit him, show the lordosis response. He pursues her. But when she's done, the key here is when she wants a break, only she can leave, and the male has to stay there. So with this paradigm, we've been able to assess whether or not the female's motivated to see the male, done with the male, needs a break from the male, and then we've been looking at how these drugs of abuse seem to augment that. You saw once she was done, she's like, I'm out of here, and she took a little break. OK, it takes two to tango, right? So we can't ignore what the males are doing. I have focused on females because very few people had done that in the past. So in, in the wild and in the laboratory, these are two rats. And you'll see what the males do. They pursue. They give a good sniff around to see if the female's in, in heat and in, you know, interesting to him. They'll mount from behind, very stereotypical. Um, and then in case you wanted it in slow motion, <laughs> the best part of this video, the slow-mo. Um, Penetration with the intermission and the goal, and this is the best part, the slow motion of this, the depositing of a sperm, right? The depositing of sperm with the ejaculation. So why that's interesting and important to me is because the female's behavior is influenced by that type of, of stimulation, such that she responds differentially to that stimulation. And when we look at the drug effects, we're going to see that it gets pushed or pulled depending on what stimulation we're looking at. So for example, the mount is the least intense stimulation. Females get approached from behind. So the females, the approach after that is quick. 
they're right back at it, right back at it. They wouldn't stay away for very long. When the, the sexual stimulation is more intense with penetration, she takes a little bit longer of a break if she were in her burrow system. And then the most intense stimulation, the ejaculation, the depositing of the sperm, the sperm is very intense and she takes a long break from that. And you see this with the approach behavior as well as the retreat. So she's more likely to leave if she's just received an intense stimulation. And we call this like a stair-step pattern. So you'll see this pattern and we can manipulate the pattern depending on the drug that we give. So another paradigm that we looked at is the mate choice paradigm. You don't fall in love with the first person you meet, right? I'm guessing, right? You meet lots of people and you date lots of people and you decide, I like you, but I don't like you. So What's difficult for people is to acknowledge that animals who are more promiscuous than humans, who have monogamous relationships, they thought, they, oh, they didn't care. I don't know, they'd have sex with anybody. And what we found in my lab with my students here is that they do care. They make a choice. They prefer one male over the other. We've been studying for the last three years what are the factors that drive that choice. But it's a very useful and interesting choice. What we see is the females will spend twice as much time with one male over the other something about them. When it comes time to um, approaching the male after they receive stimulation, they go back way faster to the male they like. And they flirt with him more. So they go in there, they hang out with him more, and they flirt with him. So we see this nice difference between the male she prefers and the male she doesn't. And the last paradigm I'm going to talk about that we've used is the, the partner preference. And this is just the, the, the name that we use in the, in the field. This is, do you want to go out on a date or do you want a girl's night home? at home, right? Do you want to hang out with your friends or do you want to go on the prowl? And so this choice we give the females is do they prefer to hang out with a male, a sexual partner, or do they prefer to hang out with a, a same-sex partner? And so we give them that choice. And when we do this, we see that females in general, when they're in heat, will spend more time with the male and they'll visit the male more, typically. Okay, so now we're armed and ready to look at some data. I only have a little bit of data to share with you, but with these tools, these paradigms, we've been able to look at how drugs like meth are acting and how they're affecting these behaviors, and they are whether or not they're indicative of what people say they're doing. We can look at how these drugs can interrupt these natural reward behaviors. And then, ideally, as a neuroscientist, I wanted to learn what parts of the brain control these behaviors. And so the results I'm going to share with you are three different drugs. The first drug is caffeine. How many of you all had a Coke or a Dr. Pepper or a cup of coffee today? Right? We are all already addicted to caffeine. You might not have been expecting me to talk about caffeine, given my crystal meth introduction, but it is the most widely used psychoactive substance in the world. It's the most common additive to drinks in the world, that's pretty impressive. It's milder, obviously, than the kind of high or the stimulation you get from crack or methamphetamine, um, and it's not illicit. Just in case you were interested, it works through the adenosine receptor and inhibits the adenosine receptor. Indirectly, that affects a neurotransmitter called dopamine, and many drugs of abuse alter dopamine. And what we found is that, guess what? Caffeine is a powerful enhancer of sexual behavior. So when I, this came out, it got a, lot, a little bit of publicity because people are like, oh, <laughs> that's an interesting use for coffee. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised Starbucks didn't pick up on this. <laughs> I'd be rich right now. So what we found in that con to conclude that there was this enhancement is when you look at that stair step in the responsiveness to the sexual stimulation, when animals were given caffeine, they went back to the male much faster after receiving an ejaculation than the animals treated with with saline. We also found that when they were given the choice between spending time with a male or spending time with a female, they visited the male more frequently than the animals given saline. Okay, so now into harder drugs. So D-amphetamine was a very common um, illicit drug given as a prescription for a diet remedy. It's also used and abused, it was really um, heavily abused by truck drivers to stay awake at night, so it keeps you awake. It also alters dopamine very directly. It releases dopamine in um, various areas of the, of the brain. We had already known that it facilitates male sexual behavior, especially when males um, were learning about sex. And this is in rats. And what we ended up finding is that a little bit like caffeine, and we'll see a little bit like methamphetamine, it enhances sexual behavior. And so this figure shows when you give repeatedly amphetamine, what you see is they flirt more 
after they've had experience with amphetamine. Um, even when the amphetamine is long out of their system, they're a lot more flirty. We also showed that there is a, a shortness, a shortening of the return latency as well. Not as robust as caffeine, which is interesting. I think it's because there's some aspects of D-amphetamine that are more aversive because of its anxiety provoking effects that caffeine doesn't have. Okay, so the last drug I'm gonna talk about is crystal meth or methamphetamine. It's really addictive, highly addictive substance. Its use is on the rise over the last 10 years. It also, its main action, pharmacologically speaking, is increasing dopamine neurotransmission, dopamine levels. But what was interesting about meth and why we started studying it was that people said, I'm using it as an aphrodisiac. It was like a cultural thing that was happening and popping up. People are like, I take it and then I have sex. And unfortunately, they would take it and have sex with lots of people. They would take it and have sex with unknown partners, anonymous partners. So they were taking lots of risky, um, making risky choices when they were on meth. So we were interested, well, is there any evidence for this? Is it anecdotal? Is it just um, a, a placebo effect? Or is it really enhancing sexual behavior? Why is it making these people be so risky? And what we found is acute and chronic exposure to methamphetamine is a very powerful enhancer of sexual behavior in our female rats in the lab. So as you can see, this looks very similar to what I showed you with the caffeine. It shortens the latency. That stair step is gone. It's flattened. They go back fast after the most intense sexual stimulation. And this was the interesting thing that we hadn't studied in other drugs, but they seem to have lost their pickiness. So when given the choice between two males, they typically will return to one faster than the other. When they were given methamphetamine, they went back to anybody and everybody super fast. So they didn't seem to care. I like him better than him. So that might be an underlying um, mechanism for this risky taking, this risk taking behavior. So in conclusion, we found that many drugs of abuse, and I have many, many more drugs that we've studied, enhance but there are some that disrupt sexual behavior. Obviously, they're not an ideal treatment for sexual dysfunction. Can't get everybody hooked on crack and methamphetamine <laughs> as a treatment for your sexual problems. But I think nonetheless, we can use this information to inform future drug um, research. Um, and then we in my lab have been working, and some of my students that are here, on other drugs that are similar but not as uh, high of abuse liability, like um, methylphenidate, which many of you are familiar with, are all known as Ritalin, and endocannabinoids, the active ingredient or the endogenous ingredient that's like THC in marijuana. And finally, I think that some of this information are studies of the intersection between sex and drugs will help um, us understand why drugs are so difficult to, to quit. And that's it. Hello. My name is Paul Glasheen. I'm a senior at SU and a piano performance major, here to introduce Dr. Kiyoshi Tamagawa, professor of music and associate dean for the Seraphim School of Fine Arts. Dr. Tamagawa first began teaching at Southwestern in 1992, the year I was born. <laughs> um, but um, prior to that, he obtained a bachelor's degree in music from the Oberlin College of Music, or sorry, the Oberlin College Conservatory, followed by a master's in music at the Yale University School of Music and a doctorate at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Tamagawa has performed as a soloist and collaborative pianist throughout North America, as well as in Europe and Asia. His association with the late violinist Eugene Fodor resulted in over 30 recitals and the release of a CD titled Witch's Brew. Their performances also took them to the National Center for the Performing Arts in Mumbai, India, and Guanajuato, Mexico. Dr. Tamagawa has performed at Wild Recital Hall, Merkin Hall, and Barge Music in New York, Wigmore Hall in London, where he was called an excellent pianist by the Strad Magazine, and on the Dame Myra Hess Memorial Concert Series in Chicago. He will appear with the Austin Symphony Orchestra this coming November in Mozart's Piano Concerto in C Major, K503, and for a second time with the Temple Symphony in 2016. He has presented sessions at national conferences of the American String Teachers Association, College Music Society, and the Music Teachers National Association, as well as state and regional conferences, including the Texas Music Educators Association, Texas Music Teachers Association, and the College Music Society. His writings on musical topics have been published in American Music Teacher, American String Teacher, and the American Suzuki Journal. Recently, he was also named as the 2013 Collegiate Teacher of the Year by the Texas Music Teachers Association. 
I was also asked to speak some about my personal experience as one of Dr. Tamagawa's students, who I've worked with since my first year at Southwestern. I feel that I've had the opportunity to grow both as a pianist and a student of music. Working with Dr. Tamagawa has encouraged me to adopt a focused and critical perspective in many aspects of my life. I also believe that that experience is not unusual. I know that many students who have worked with Dr. Tamagawa have been greatly impressed and influenced by the extent of his abilities as a performer, scholar, and educator. It's an honor to be part of the Southwestern community and to introduce to you Dr. Kiyoshi Tamagawa. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm speaking into my lovely mind. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, President Berger. Uh, I'm not as courageous as Faye. I actually have a prepared text, which is why I <laughs> appear to be hiding behind this podium. But, uh, and thank you, President Berger, trustees, faculty, colleagues, students, and all of you who are here today to participate in this experiment. I'm very honored and a bit terrified to talk about some of my recent scholarly work with you. Even though I am a musical performer by training and performing and teaching on my instrument are, I'm, are my main occupations at Southwestern, I do on occasion venture into research and scholarship in the generally understood sense at an institution of higher education. My writings and papers and presentations are inspired by and take as their starting point questions that arise from either my performing or teaching. So I would like to talk about two such projects today. What they have in common, and I did have to do some thinking about this, my own paideia-based thinking, I think, is that they both deal with the idea of musical authenticity. Now, this is a very loaded word in classical musical circles. Every performer thinks that they know what an authentic performance is, and they usually know what it isn't, the other performers. <laughs> There's a story that's been told many times about the great Polish harpsichordist Wanda Landowska, a pioneer in the early 20th century in reviving performances of the music of Johann Sebastian Bach on the instrument he composed for, the harpsichord. She is reputed once to have said to the great Spanish cellist Pablo Casals, whose love of Bach was certainly as fervent as hers, quote, you play Bach your way, and I'll play him his way. <laughs> and, and you can imagine that said with a Polish accent and a suitably imperious tone of voice. His reaction is not recorded, unfortunately. <laughs> However, the multiple levels that at which performers, teachers, and scholars grapple with authenticity go far beyond deciding how to perform the scores of composers of past centuries and on what instruments. The very music itself may not be authentic. It may have been extensively edited, reorchestrated, and otherwise altered. And it may not even have been composed by the person to whom it is commonly attributed. This peculiar phenomenon of what amounts to musical forgery was the topic of a paper I presented to the South Central chapter of the College Music Society in the spring of 2011, and it's titled Fabricating the Past, Baroque String Arrangements and Original String Compositions in Baroque Style of the Late 19th and Early 20th Centuries, and the following paragraphs are some uh, excerpts from what I've said. Classical art music, over roughly the last 50 to 60 years has experienced a trend toward what is commonly known as historically informed performance, HIP, or HIP. This term encompasses many different approaches, but it is safe to say that they all take as their basis the composer's original intentions as accurately as they can be determined through existing texts and knowledge of contemporary performance practice. The concept of authentic performance is paramount in historically informed performers' minds. Such an attitude, however, has not always been the norm. The looser approaches of earlier times are still evident in the training of today's music students and the material they study. This is particularly true of repertoire for stringed instruments composed up through the late 18th century, what we now call Baroque music. Professional concert performances these days of the violin and keyboard sonatas of Arcangelo Corelli, George Frederick Handel, or the concertos of Antonio Vivaldi always use so-called urtext editions based on autograph manuscripts and first printed editions. However, many students still study the same pieces in editions that date from the 19th and early 20th century, whose texts are often radically different from what their composers actually put on paper. The remarks of various critics and commentators of that time suggest that by then, 
the, early 19th, uh, the late 19th or early 20th century, that by then, what was often dismissively called ancient music had lost its expressive power for concert goers. Baroque music was no longer capable of conveying the passion or strong emotion that 18th century audiences had perceived in it. The slender orchestrations of Vivaldi's concertos must have seemed thin and inadequate. The modest range and virtuosity of solo parts in comparison to the standard concertos of Beethoven, Mendelssohn, and Brahms not nearly enough to excite any admiration. Elaborations and additions to solo and orchestral parts may therefore have been a means by which 19th century performers and editors sought to recapture the passion and intensity that they themselves perceived in the originals, but that they feared audiences at the time would miss. From editing and altering music of the past, almost beyond recognition in some cases, it apparently was just a short step to creating such music entirely from whole cloth. Some favorite, quote, Baroque pieces still studied and performed today were not composed in the time period to which they are ascribed, but much later. This practice of publishing original compositions while claiming that they were rediscovered works from the 18th century is mainly a phenomenon of the early 20th century. Among the, well, uh, among the most well-known of such instances today are such hoaxes as the compositions by the renowned Austrian violinist Fritz Kreisler that collectively compi comprise the so-called classical manuscripts, which began to appear in 1905, and concertos for viola attributed to Handel and Johann Christian Bach, that's Bach's youngest son, composed by, actually, uh, by a man named Henri Casadesu, published in 1924 and 1947. Yet another composition familiar to today's audiences that was originally presented to the public as a Baroque work appeared as late as 1958. This was the year that the so-called Albinoni Adagio was published, ostensibly re reconstructed from a fragment by the Italian Baroque composer, but actually wholly composed by the Itali Italian musicologist Remo Giazzotto. And at this point, uh, I'd like to play a few um, audio excerpts of these pieces. So this is, uh, and I'm, these are very short clips, and I apologize for that, but I'm actually trying to stay within the bounds of fair use if you know about copyright law. Uh, this is an uh, excerpt from a very uh, lovely recording by the London Philharmonic. Then uh, uh, the introduction, uh, the beginning of the first movement of this fabricated viola concerto by Handel. Again, actually, it was composed by a man, uh, Henri Casadesu, who actually was, and you can read a little bit about him and his musical activities on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. 
So the motivation of these actually quite reputable musicians in perpetrating these forgeries in most cases remains obscure to us. Fritz Kreisler's decades-long hoax received considerable attention in the musical press at the time it was discovered around 1935 due to the violinist then worldwide fame and adoration by the musical public. He's the only one I was able to find who made any sorts of statements about why he did this. His stated rationale for attaching the names of obscure Baroque comp composers to works of his own composition was, believe it or not, modesty. Quote, necessity forced this course on me 30 years ago when I was desirous of enlarging my concert programs. I found it impudent and tactless to repeat my name endlessly on printed programs. <laughs> The question remains, why then did he choose to compose his own, quote, early music rather than editing and performing authentic examples by other composers? He had, in fact, done this with many other works. The mystery of motivation becomes even more relevant in the case of Henri Casadesu, the fabricator of concerti by Handel and J.C. Bach, who was a member of a pioneering early music society in Paris at the turn of the 20th century a group that gave concerts on by then obsolete instruments and claimed at the time to be premiering long lost compositions. Remo Giazzotto, the actual composer of the so-called Albinoni Adagio, this is a piece, by the way, and you may know this, it, that's gained quite a bit of modern uh, renown through its use as background music in several hit motion pictures of the late, 17, uh, late 1970s and 1980s. Uh, just a quick search of IMDb revealed that it was used, for example, in um, Flashdance, uh, Rollerball, and um, probably the most uh, well-known example to us today is um, Gallipoli, well, an early picture of Mel Gibson's. Uh, anyway, uh, so it's gained an extensive modern audience through its use as background music had similarly sound credentials as a musicologist and authority on the very composer whose name he appropriated. Why did they do it? Uh, my partial as answer in the presentation that I gave was as follows. Both the extensive re-editing and rescoring of authentic Baroque works of Vivaldi and Handel and the composition of completely spurious Baroque solo pieces and concerti seem to stem from a common desire to up update the aesthetic of pre-classical music and make it palatable to modern audiences. The result of both these trends is a body of literature that today might be termed pseudo-Baroque a group of compositions that are actually surprisingly similar in sound, whether or not they are authentic. These pieces bear or retain some of the fingerprints of 18th century style in terms of harmonic and rhythmic straightforwardness, formal clarity, and comparative mod modest technical demands on the performer. However, as far as scoring and texture are concerned, they are completely of the modern concert era. They are, in they are intended for performance by modern instruments and ensembles steel string violins, Steinway grand pianos, and symphony orchestras. These fabricated compositions, both free arrangements and original works, will undoubtedly continue to be performed and studied for the foreseeable future due to their widespread currency in music education and in the case of the Albinoni Adagio, the popular entertainment media. On balance, it is difficult to see that any lasting harm might result from this. The purism that flourishes at institutions of higher musical training will serve as a corrective to any distorted views of early music that students might gain as a result of studying this ersatz literature. It, is al it also is wise to acknowledge in a modern classical musical scene cl quick to condemn anything that lacks the stamp of authenticity that many of these works, as you can hear, are of high musical quality. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, my second project, which again is intimately related to my own performance. As you heard, I have the very great privilege of appearing next month with the Austin Symphony Orchestra in two performances. I will be performing a concerto for piano and orchestra by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And as, at, the result, at, at the risk of seeming too basic, I did want to define some basic terms for you. A concerto is a work composed for a solo instrument in an orchestra. One of the musical purposes of such a work is to set the virtuosity of a single soloist against the mass and power of an orchestra. Indeed, one derivation of the term is from the Latin verb concertare, meaning to fight or to contend. To this end, many concertos from the 18th century incorporate what are called cadenzas. The Austrian pianist Paul Badura Skoda 
gives a good explanation of what a cadenza is in his renowned book, Interpreting Mozart on the Keyboard. So I'd like to quote from that. He says, the art of free improvisation flourished in the 18th century to an extent only possible in times of great musical creativity. It was an indispensable part of every virtuoso's equipment if he hoped to be able to satisfy his listeners' high artistic standards. Improvisation was not only a duty, it was also a right. Thus, in the instrumental concertos of this period, there are places where, in accordance with tradition, the orchestra stops playing and the soloist is given the opportunity to show off his abilities and indulge his fantasies." End quote. So this is a basic definition of a cadenza and it applies very well to Mozart's concertos. But Badura Skoda goes on to note, I quote again, in many cases Mozart, rather against the prevailing custom at the time, wrote out these cadenzas for himself. However, he did not do so for all of the concertos he composed and he did not do so for the one that I will be performing. Therefore, in modern day performances, there are a few pianists who are brave enough to attempt a historically informed performance and improvise their cadenzas on the spot. This is not me. <laughs> <laughs> Most either find a pre-composed cadenzas, and there's no lack of those, or as I um, am doing, attempt to formulate one of their own. This, as you can imagine, is a daunting task. And once again, I quote Paul Badura Skoda. It is quite impossible to make up anything that can stand in comparison with Mozart's own music in any style. But cadenzas in a wholly un-Mozartian style cannot help offending the spirit of the work. Inappropriate, unstylish cadenzas often suggest a tumor in an organism that is otherwise perfect and healthy." End quote. 18th century performers actually also, many, uh, in many cases, pre-composed their cadenzas. Not everyone was an improviser on the level of Mozart and Beethoven. They did this often enough that the contemporary theorist Daniel Gottlob Türk formulated detailed rules for doing so in his Klavierschule, Keyboard School, a, a book that remains a valuable primary source of 18th century performance practice. And again, here are some quotes from what he says. The cadenza must have the most exact connections with the piece that is being played, or rather, it should take its material from the latter on the basis of what is most important. Monstrously long cadenzas lasting several minutes are on no account to be excused. Finally, one must on no account stray into musical country where the composer has not been in the course of the piece. This rule has its basis in the law of a unity of a work of art." End quote. So, trying to follow the wise advice of Paul Badura Skoda and Turk, I have attempted to supply a cadenza for the first movement of Mozart's Piano Concerto Number 25, using themes and passage work composed by Mozart himself and arranging and linking them in ways similar to the cadenzas the composer left himself for some of his other concertos. This project presents an interesting paradox <clears throat> in relation to the first research project I quoted from, which you may already have discerned. I am creating what amounts to a musical forgery. I'm trying to make the listeners believe that Mozart might have composed this cadenza. In other words, I'm inserting something inauthentic into the performance of a great work by Mozart to give the impression of authenticity. This doesn't bear too much thinking, actually, if you think about it. Um, anyway, but I have tried my inauthentic Mozart cadenza in a performance of the concerto that actually I gave at Southwestern last month. Uh, and again, we're several levels removed from authenticity here. Since, of course, I couldn't have a full orchestra, I played the work in an arrangement for um, piano and small ensemble, uh, flute, violin, and cello, that was actually made by his um, pupil, Johann Nepomuk Hummel, who studied with Mozart when he was at the tender age of 11, toward the end of Mozart's life, uh, and revised by me. And we're playing on a Steinway concert grand, which Mozart would not have known. Um, but nevertheless, I'd like to continue, uh, conclude this talk by playing a video clip from this performance. This uh, begins with my own cadenza and continues on into the final tutti or orchestral passage from the actual concerto movement by, by Mozart. So you can judge for yourselves how successful I was in staying true to Mozart's style and thus giving an authentic performance of this great piece. Thanks for your time and attention.
invite both um, speakers uh, onto the front and anyone who is actually in the other room who's watching this and would like to contribute, please uh, join us here. There's, there's lots of room. We're only going to be here for just a few more minutes to share some ideas. And if we could turn on the lights, by the way, because I have no AV things, it'd be great to be able to see everybody. Uh, well, I thought they were just identical, didn't you? <laughs> well, I'm new to this paideia stuff, so I'll, I'll try. Good. The, the connection that I noticed is the notion that sometimes the addition of something artificial or arguably inauthentic can improve the quality of a performance and make it more satisfying to the participants. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Alisa. Um, I was struck when uh, Kiyoshi mentioned the mystery of motivation uh, and uh, talking in the context of forgery, but of course then motivation and sexual behavior, it seems like a, uh, a nice connection between the two. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, David. Well, on a similar note, I put together a title for the two presentations, which goes motivation, comma, performance, comma, and placebos in vermin and plagiarists. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Other observations that, that you see? Yes, please. Well, as a biochemistry major, I actually kind of latched onto musical forgery and how basically when we do experiments, we are kind of forging. And mm. so if we can't work with the human body, we do take other models like with rats. And so even though it's not what we're trying to study, it's kind of an approximation. And so same thing with music. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Yes, in front, Jess. So one of the things that humans do, I think, is to try to make sense of their world. In making sense of, in making sense of one's world, what, what interests me a bit between two different, very different professions is the idea of what is evidence. What constitutes mm -hmm. evidence in experimental psychology and what constitutes evidence in, in a music uh, performance kind of thing. I think about that a lot and have often thought that they differ a lot, but in fact, both are using pattern recognition and patterns to try to understand their world. So Faye is looking at patterns of, of rodent behavior and trying to relate that to human behavior, and Kiyoshi is actually listening to patterns of, uh, of notes and wondering how those relate between uh, former people and, and later composers. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, please. We'll get you a, a mic. Uh, so one similarity I noticed was kind of the sense of something false. So in the pseudo-baroque, that's a false thing that comes from something real. And then how humans normally have a sex drive, but it's also creating a false heightened sense of sex drive from drugs of abuse. Excellent. Thank you. Other observations people want to share? Yes, yeah, Mac. Uh, a connection I saw that I think is kind of contrastingly is uh, Dr. Garachi mentioned that the, the rat model has evolved over time to be more accurate, I suppose, if that's an okay way of putting it, where, uh, in, but moving forward in time, where with the pseudo baroque, that is going backwards in time to be more accurate, and the the more accurate item is in the past and not in the future. Hmm. Great, thank you. Very nice. Yes, please. You've got to be really loud if you're not going to use a mic. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We need to hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, the fact that uh, we need. Apparently, you know, the audience uh, would need to be stimulated by the pseudo baroque to enjoy it. The fact that uh, that is recognized or thought of 
and then the same with drugs just was um, I can't really explain what I want to say but that was my connection was that it's just what's happening to us <laughs> that we can't enjoy the old but that we can't enjoy natural okay can you pass it right behind right behind you to uh, to Helene I was thinking along very similar lines to our um, last speaker and was thinking about the fact that we, we think about passion and intensity in some ways as natural, but I think both of your talks point to the ways in which passion and intensity is constructed um, uh, by history and um, uh, by chemicals. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dan. Um. Provided that you like Mozart, they both cause dopamine release. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> yes, uh, please, Daryl. We're talking about uh, both of these things being uh, effectively performances of some, some characteristic, and we've got both a performer and an audience, hmm. and where there's an introduction of something artificial by the performer who typically is has the impression and their reality is that that artificial inclusion makes it a better performance or they're intending for it to be a better performance that may or may not be the perspective of the, of the viewer or the audience. Hmm. Very nice. Yes, please. Um, we've been talking a lot about inauthenticity and what that sort of constructs and creates. And I think that's very similar to a placebo effect. If you call it Baroque, does it sound Baroque? And if you enjoy it, that makes you highly cultured. Mm. If you take a pill that's supposedly supposed to do something to you and doesn't, but you still feel like it is. I was noticing those similarities. Interesting. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah, Mary. Here it comes. I was just thinking about the Brown Symposium in which we have Jeremy Brunet's films and videos coming, and they're supposed to make you feel better supposed to heal you from within, and I thought, why couldn't that be possible? Because every time I go to a movie, I either come out crying <laughs> or they're exhilarated. And if our body is the chemical machine we think it is, it seems to me that if you could control the patterns that Jess was talking about, and if you can control the way in which you receive the patterns and the colors, you could certainly redirect that chemical energy. And I see Faye <laughs> nodding. But I, I found that an interesting connection. Thank you. collaboration here between you two. Great rap of second uh, soloist album was called Hot Rats. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a jazz instrumental uh, that he did in the early 70s that, that he, that he uh, did in honor of his son's weasel. And I think, I think you've got some material there. And <laughs> With Hot Rats. Thank you. Um, another insight from our board of trustees. <laughs> Frank Zappa. No. I like it. I like it. It all makes sense now. It does, yeah. I, I have to admit, this must have been what he was thinking. Other reactions or observations that people would like to share with the group? Yeah, please. Um, I just found it amazing that, um, so going back to looking at patterns and how we make sense of things in our world through patterns, um, the tools that we use can vary in enormous ways. Um, one doctor is looking at um, how patterns affect us through music, and the other is looking at rats. I just think that's amazing, and it makes both concepts tangible to us. Mm and the way that we perceive them. So I thought that was awesome. The tools that we use are amazing. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah, I'll just be loud. Um, <laughs> so, so after Dr. Gracchi's speech, I found myself asking, why don't we just give meth to people and say it's sexually dysfunctional? Uh, and, and then I think that Dr. Tamagawa gave the answer to that, uh, and that's authenticity. Um, you know, because even, even if you know giving meth to somebody does fix their sexual dysfunction, so often what you hear uh, about people on meth is you hear their loved ones say that this isn't you when you're on meth. Mm. This isn't the real you. You're someone else. You're being inauthentic. Uh, you know, and, and, then, and, I, and then I was thinking, what, what is authentic, the normal bar uh, in Dr. Garachi's speech? Is that what authentic is? And I think that authentic is something more than that. I think that authentic isn't just what is normal 
uh, and being and giving an authentic performance isn't just replicating Mozart as perfectly as you can. And I think the reason for that is there's uh, there's a value statement in authentic, it, mm. you know, kind of this in this moral sense that it's not just doing it's not just doing the thing in the in the right way. It's doing it well and the performing in the way that you are meaning to perform and the way that the performance is meant to be conveyed. And I think that that's maybe what you lose when you give drugs to, to rats and watch them have sex. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe sex, you know, sex on meth isn't the way that sex is meant to be done. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and I agree, by the way. <laughs> That, uh, that actually might be a great comment uh, on which to stop. Uh, there, there'll be lots of time for conversation amongst yourselves and also with our speakers, but can we take a moment to not only thank all of you, but to thank our speakers as well. Thank you.